Welcome to episode 72 of Comic Book Nation, the official podcast of comicbook.com. I am your host, Kofi Outlaw, and I am back in the studio today. And back with me are my co-hosts, straight from the New York Comic Con streets, Mr. Matthew Aguilar. What's up? And Mr. Brandon Davis. What's up? I can't believe you told everybody we made Matt sleep on the streets. I mean, I just really assumed by now that they knew from this podcast and the way we treat him that that's exactly what we would do to him. But, I look uh, really tan on camera right now. That's okay. Good. <laughs> I'm just uh, saying. Yes, that rainy New York that humble brag just great. now. I'm just tan. saying, like, it's 60 degrees out and Matt's talking about how tan, tan right there. Look at that. Wow. Headline. Brown man claims to be more tan. Ever, evergreen tan, man. Yeah, okay. You see how white I look? Yeah, by comparison. Well, this is what the people came to hear. This is what the people <laughs> want to know. The state of you, you guys started tans. by putting me out in the street. No, I didn't. I said we were straight from the New York streets covering New York Comic Con. That has nothing to do with you anybody. You said it. All right, so. I think the playback on this is going to be very <laughs> shocking for you when you realize like, I just we did are. a normal statement. Episode 72 yeah, is yeah, off 72. to a hot start. I don't think great. So. so as you can tell, things are going great after New York Comic Con. Yeah. We are back. Uh, you can probably see us again because we have the cameras back on. We are back in the studio here in our undisclosed list location somewhere in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, today we're going to be, of course, I said all that as a segue to say we're going to be recapping uh, the final two days of New York Comic Con when we last spoke to everyone. We had just gotten done with Thursday. Matt had to literally run out of the room to go see something. Uh, and that didn't change for the last two days. So we're going to recap what was seen in uh, New York Comic Con and every, all the headlines that came out. But we're also going to be talking about things beyond that because we've gotten some new news items to talk about. There's rumors of that MCU Nova movie, and uh, that's why I brought Brandon Davis on, I know, He's chomping at the bit to discuss that. We also are getting a new extension of the John Wick franchise. We've gotten our first details from the next generation of PlayStation. And there's this little movie called Joker that we may or may not have some pretty divisive opinions about. And so we're here to argue about all that today. So let's jump into it and get started. First up in our new segment, Marvel's Hulu Universe. Uh, kind of... Got a little bit of a shift to the backseat when we learned that um, Ghost Rider, the Ghost Rider series on Hulu, had been canceled. But there's still something coming. Marvel's still getting supernatural with Hellstrom, the Hellstrom siblings. And today we got a big first kind of step forward with Marvel's Hellstrom Hulu series in the fact that we got first casting for the show. So here's who we got. According to the news breaks, Tom Austin from the, uh, Austin from the Royals will be playing Damian Hellstrom, while Sidney Lemon from Fear the Walking Dead Infamy will be playing El, uh, Anna Hellstrom. Okay? Okay. <laughs> yeah, and they now have one L in the name, just so we're all clear, especially those of us who have to write it, so that people aren't getting confused about why it's only called Hellstrom, and then there's people with two L's, and that L can really throw things in a branding situation, so one L. And, uh, yeah, they've included some supporting cast members. Uh, Elizabeth Marvel, that, yeah, she will play Victoria Hellstrom, uh, who's been institutionalized. And that she's their mother, I believe. I'm not familiar with this, Matt, so if I make a mistake, you got to give, no, give me the comics look like. I'll give you this look of, like, you seem so enthusiastic about this. <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to make it sound enthusiastic. Ro <laughs> Robert Wisdom from Ballers is the caretaker. Ballers. Who has a knowledge of the occult. June Carroll from Mindhunter is Dr. Louise Hastings, um, a psychologist. And uh, Anna or Ariana Guerrera. From Insatiable is Gabriella Rossetti. Oh, man. These are all the... Oh, man. I read that Alan, as Grande, by the way, when we were first going through I know. This. So did I. I had to stop myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lane Uy is from The Passage is Chris That Yang. might have got me excited for a Hulu series. Ariana Grande in a Marvel series. And uh, Gabriella Rossetti is a good one that I want to talk about. I mean, we don't really know. I mean, let's be honest. We don't know who half these characters are. Most Marvel people, besides say, the, the yeah, Hellstrom 90%. siblings, like, don't know who they are. 90% as... of Marvel fans don't know who those people are. Yeah, I mean, like... Hellstrom's are relatively obscure. And that kind of works for it, in yeah. a sense. Like, as we talked about, these are, these are kind of relatively obscure characters, so the show can put its own kind of stamp on them. But um, that's who we're getting to play them, and... I'm always curious, BD, how do you feel about this? Because I know you're kind of ambivalent about things that aren't going to be in the main MCU lineup. So how are you feeling about Hellstrom? Did this casting change everything for you? 
No. <laughs> <laughs> no. What the, what? <laughs> Who are the people you just named? Um, One is no, not I mean, Ariana it's like, I don't... <laughs> Uh, it's, it's just the Hulu stuff. I just feel like it's going to come and go. It's like, I, I just have a feeling it's just all going to go the way Swamp Thing did. Because Marvel Studios is going to just slowly consume Marvel TV, and eventually none of this is going to matter, so I don't want to invest my time in it, and it's hard to get interested. Oh, that was bleak. Was... I mean, is that, but... Is that I mean, like... I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying it's bleak. Eh, it's just... So, I mean, maybe I'll watch it. So I'm reading the synopsis for what this show is going to do, and so I got one question. Why is this not Prodigal Son? Why is it? Why does it feel like Constantine? Because no. Prodigal Son is already a good show. <laughs> okay, so the the whole synopsis is that Damien is initially presented seemingly as the son of a serial killer with a sibling named Anna. Mm -hmm. Right, that's Prodigal Son, the new Fox show. Yeah, his dad's yeah. a serial killer. He's a uh, yeah with Jesus from The Walking Dead. Tom yeah. Payne. Yeah, Tom Payne, who plays a forensic profiler, who's the son of a serial killer, mm -hmm. who's played by uh, what's his name. Um, Michael, uh, I forget, Michael Sheen from, like, oh. Underworld and all that, mm -hmm. who plays a really good serial killer in this, and he has a sister who's a news reporter. So, and a mother who's troubled. Yeah. So how is this not Prodigal Son? Because it's called Hellstrom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Marvel's, Marvel's, Marvel's Prodigal, Prodigal Son. There it is. Oh, yeah. Colin Hellstrom. Hellstrom. So, okay, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm... I'm liking Prodigal Son, which is why I'm kind of like, okay, so I guess we're going to marvel this, but maybe we'll find out the big twist is it's not a serial killer. It was Satan was his father. <laughs> I'm still and that'll not. that'll be like the Marvel thing. So, yeah, man, I don't know. Well, this was a news item. There were people in it, and we presented <laughs> Listen, it to it's a slow you. news week. <laughs> and we presented it to I'm you. So we're so bad for Hellstrom right now. Like, um, and, and you know what? They might drop a trailer for Hellstrom where we're all like, oh, damn, that looks awesome. I mean, awesome, if Marvel but, makes right. a prodigal son show that's, that, that is as dark as kind of like that and combines some fantastical supernatural stuff, I guess I'll come around. But right now, I'm just like... Thinking, why did I even include you in this lineup, Hellstrom? I think also, Hellstrom. is it part of it, too, that like people, I think, were way more excited that this was connected yeah, was to Ghost Rider? Like, I'm like typing to you guys on the side here, like, hey, you guys got any Ghost Rider insight we could add to this segment? <laughs> but I think that's what it is, right? It's hard not to compare, since yeah, they I mean, were going to be kind of sort of part of the same right. thing, and now you take out the most interesting part, and you go with a character that, I mean, there it's are just a fans. Guy who sometimes, only sometimes, wears a shirt. Yeah. Yeah, I just cool. feel like Marvel TV is like, all right, who can we still use? Uh, okay, Hellstrom. Let's give the Hellstrom a show. Uh, but I, eh, eh. Yeah. it could be great. I though. asked Jeff Loeb about it at, at New York Comic Con. What did he say? And he said, "Stop asking Ooh. me so many questions." Um, something along those lines. No, he was just like, uh, Ooh. he made it sound like it's going to be really dark and scary. Hmm. He gave you the Star Lord. Who? Who is Hellstrom? Um, moving right along. So, in terms of uh, universes making weird expansion choices, the John Wick franchise is expanding, and uh, it's going to be doing so in a kind of weird way. Here's the a thing. A spinoff yeah, series is coming called Ballerina, which, and I quote, focuses on a young female assassin who seeks revenge against the people who killed her family. The picture is on Fast Track with a script by Shay Hatton, uh, who did Army of the Dead, for Netflix, Jack Zack Snyder's new film, and John Wick 3 Parabellum. So basically, if you saw John Wick 3, there's a scene that's set in a theater where uh, Angelica, it's Angelica Houston's character, and a bunch of people kind of storm in because they're looking for John Wick, and they do some wreak some havoc on the theater. And it sounds like is this show kind of grows out of that, uh, about a female assassin who wants to get back at the people who did this, which... Is a weird spinoff choice. Uh, am I right? <laughs> it's a little. It's one I would expect after like John Wick Five. Yeah, because John right, because all then, out of ideas. Yeah, because then you've hit the wall, right? Of like, okay, well, now let's get a younger face in there. Let's change things up, and yeah, I would, I would get that. It does seem a little early for this kind of thing, but hey, whatever. I mean, if I guess people want more John Wick, right? Tug Speedman is Scorcher Three. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, I mean, but it's just a weird time because, I mean, the great thing has been the reaction on social media to this news. Uh, I think somebody said it's like, I forget, people are just comparing it to like weird things you would spin out of like another object, like some random piece. 
be like if you got a new shoe and you only like took out the one lease and we're like here let's make a show about this and like, from the popcorn universe yeah and it's like also a weird time because people just keep coming back like uh and they're hearing this and they're just like um i, a I don't watch Halle john Berry. wick like dude I don't. john wick 3 just introduced this new See, that's female the character one I yeah yeah when when I first, that's what everybody who clicked yeah. on this article when i first thinks, saw the headline like, oh, i went word? oh Halle Berry's getting her yeah, own that thing. sophia's getting her own show i'd watch that and then they're like nope nope <laughs> but <laughs> i don't watch the that john wick movies scene? for the story like i don't watch the john wick movies for this growing universe and they do a good job of like making they've slowly kind of expanded the john wick world with the continental and all that through each movie it's gotten bigger each time and it's interesting but come on, I watch the movies for Keanu Reeves just doing crazy stuff. I, maybe it's just me. I watch those movies because Keanu Reeves is like a b- total badass, and he's back in the front of the action movies. And like, they, yeah, that's th- part of it. Like, I don't know. I don't really care for I'd the story. I watch a whole movie with Halle Berry. Do you care for the story? Either. Yeah, I would watch Halle no, Berry I mean, because I met yeah, her. I, I, yeah. I, I like, don't agree with you in the sense that I think John Wick is a rare case where the world building is instrumental into what that made that movie distinct, as opposed to just another born or action movie yeah. generic thing. I think a lot of people do care about the story in yeah, the sense of that's fair. not like the actual they, they're not like putting together entire timeline theories and stuff, but they but they like the assassin underworld, the money, the currency, how it works, you know, the rules <coughs> of the Continental Hotel and how that all works, how they get contracts, what's off limits and why, like all of the politics. People really like that stuff. That's I mean, all it, cool, but I think if you had like just an average action star doing average action that wasn't from Chad Stahelski, it wouldn't be as interesting and it wouldn't have gotten this far. I don't know. Maybe it would have. I, 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 think, Maybe it's just I think you're picking at one side or the other one. It's the combination of the two that makes oh, John sure. Wick okay. work so well. So I, I see where their logic is. Like the ballerina will kind of basically we, we begin John Wick right in the middle of things. He's already been a master assassin. He's already come up in this world. He's kind of been the top of it and he tried to retire and we know what happens after that um th- two and three and especially three were really good about filling in some backstory oh yeah of who john wick was and how he got into this and the kind of dark way he came into this but we haven't had been able to kind of ride the back of somebody actually entering this world from the real world for the first time like coming from normal everyday society coming into the assassin world, having to learn each step and like what goes on and what this all is and be trained in it. Um, we haven't seen that. So I, I'm going to guess that's what they're going for with this. Uh, and it's not a bad theory because it's what the purge is doing. Um, the born, I mean, we're getting to this point where TV and, and action movie franchises are beginning to use TV as a, a legitimate content or a continuity expansion yeah. format. The Purge started it when it linked the first Purge to this series that is you know, now directly linked to that story and expanding that world. Um, Treadstone, we just learned that Bourne series is going to be directly related to the next Bourne movie and kind of feeding into that. And it seems like this is that. My only thing is... So you think you if this was a, weird, a... You think if this was a movie, it would be I think I'm about to like, well, say what I mean. Like My only thing is like you picked... <laughs> A really, really weird entry point to to accomplish this. The random ballerina character is a really weird thing, is what I'm saying. I'm right. agreeing. Yeah, like that's weird. I agree, but and also if it like, wasn't but, set in this world, and you just told me this was a story, I'd be like, no thanks. I saw La Femme Nikita. I'm good. <laughs> I mean, I think a Sophia movie like Halle Berry at the front of it, doing the awesome stuff she was doing in John oh, Wick Three, could do as well. But like, right. and I think any random character from these movies telling the story that you th- you're saying is interesting. I mean, it is interesting, but I mean, I think that just picking a random character and assuming they're going to be, people are going to be drawn in by the world of John Wick. I think you'll, you would see at the box office that <coughs> it would be significantly less. Yeah. Than, and that's my, and that's my, and we're in agreement about that. Yeah. It's yeah. that this is a, a risky thing to take. My only thing is I can see how they'll spin this all around to say, that this person becomes a master assassin who ends up blaming John Wick for what happened to her family uh, and then thinks even if she gets even with everybody else, she's got to take on John Wick, which would set up more interesting rivalry to come in the future. Yeah. Um, but again, I think you're right. Like, I think it's just a risk because it is a risk. So that's that. We're not in disagreement over that one. Uh, 
Matt, I know you're heavily invested in this John Wick universe, so you just try to hang tight, buddy. <laughs> okay, next up, something we can all sink our teeth into, uh, the MCU. We've got new rumors, and we've all been expecting that Nova is coming, okay? Like, we are the first, in, I mean, some of the biggest pushers of Nova theory in this business. Um, a little bit because we've seen legitimate points where it could be happening, and also because we just want it to happen. A little bit of both. Uh, and now we're hearing rumors that it is going to definitely happen by 2022, I believe, was the rumor. That's what they say. That's what they say. The rumors say. And uh, there's some other good parts about it. Uh, Brandon Davis, take us through this. Like, uh, I mean, there, was a, saying, there I mean. was a Marvel creative like retreat, I guess. All the powers that be at Marvel met in San Francisco and like talked about the future of Marvel Studios, Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, and the name Nova got tossed around a lot, and apparently the rumor is that he's going to be coming... Uh, to the MCU in 2022. Now, we don't know if this is his own movie. We don't know if this is in Guardians 3 or Captain Marvel sequel uh, or how... That's right. Could or, be. or Disney... Play. Yeah, it could be in one of the Disney Plus shows. Are those going to be cosmic, though, the 2022 shows? Moon Knight, uh, She-Hulk, and Miss Marvel? Are those going to be cosmic? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't he be introduced? Well, no, I'm just saying, like, they could do the same thing with them and end up launching his own sure, series. Sure, sure. That That's yeah. true. Uh, yeah, we could be getting four Disney Plus shows that year. You never know. Um but yeah, that's the rumor, and it's said to be Richard Ryder, which is exciting. As much as I love Sam Alexander, I think it's cool to get Richard first. Either one's cool with me. Um, yeah, I mean, either one is cool with me. I like, I'd be happy with either. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why. I think I'd rather get Richard Ryder just for the legacy. Per like he's he was I mean, first. Yeah, even I think we've had this discussion the three of us at least on this show a couple times, and it's like, yeah, even if they introduce Sam Alexander, I would want it to be a story of him meeting. Yeah. Richard Ryder. Yeah, like it, it, it mix it up and mash it yeah. up, and they, they do that in Kyle the MCU. Rain story with Richard Ryder though being like the surviving person who's all messed up and battered and being like, yeah, having to get this kid back on and like and show him and having to get on the horse himself, like yeah. And then introducing Alexander brings a great, you know, brings an awesome dynamic that they don't have yet. Yeah, yeah. So I love that. Yeah. I think I mean you could yeah like I, I really love that idea of mashing it up and but and and also Richard Ryder's story like has to ha goes back to you know leaving his family on Earth with all those choices and then Sam Alexander's story is also driven by trying to find his dad yeah I mean I was you, you like know. the kind of rights that you got to give Richard Ryder yeah we a already reason to I, leave I wrote that very theory piece behind. up like yeah I mean but, this is the fix right just make Richard Ryder. Sam Alexander's dad. Yeah, but yeah, in that case, you do have to cut. Like, then you can easily cross into Richard Ryder being a total dick for leaving his son on Earth, like knowingly. Yeah. You got to really find a good reason for him to do that. Like, like he could have, he had to have no choice or something. Like, what is a good reason to leave your son behind on yeah. Earth? Is, I mean, is the, there the one? The other question. I mean, it's the one that you know. Great, it goes back. I mean, history and stuff. But like, great. Whenever you see things about like great men, the untold story is that they can't be great men and great fathers at the same time, which you hear a lot about. Yeah. Like celebrities, great people from history. Mm -hmm. Like you hear a lot of, you know, we'll be all like, oh, this person was great. We have a day celebrating him. And their kids were like, yeah, that's great. I wish I had my dad. And like, you yeah. know. Um, mm -hmm. True. And but so, also like, yeah, if something called you away, a destiny to something big in the universe, and you had to give up this one sacrifice for yourself, it looks really selfless and awesome. Until you the character of your son yeah. gets to speak and start saying stuff, and Very then true. not so often. Then yeah, I don't want to kind of villainize Richard Ryder. Like, no, it wouldn't be villainized. Be. Nobody's a villain in that uh, story. Yeah, but like, I don't, like, I don't really like. I mean, but he was, to be fair, he was angsty as hell in the nineties, and yeah. thousands. I mean, if you really, like, those true. books were, he was so whiny and like and it's not so vilifying when sam alexander is going to be presented as a kid like in high school yeah. and stuff who has to then maybe make the same exact choice but right. you can find a way to do it yeah you, can, you could you, you could find a way also but also you introduce Nova, it's a great back door to introduce Darkhawk. <laughs> also a great back door to bring <laughs> thanos back to the mcu for more content which no. I think is let it go. He's no. Uh, how does it? How is it not? Do you? Okay, understand? But he actually no. did. I said this the same makes thing. Perfect he did sense. sell me on because it. I mean, it's different. It's different from the comics in terms of who destroys Xandar. But if you want to tell an origin story and you want to sell tickets to a character who non-Marvel comics fans aren't familiar with, you put Thanos in the trailer because he's the most popular villain in the world right now, besides the Joker. So, because in this would be a scene that takes place. It's just a flashback okay. pre-Infinity War where Thanos destroys Xandar and Richard Ryder escapes and gets the whole Nova Force. Well, it's good to know you're learning things from all these Marvel premieres. Like, that's the way to do it. Yeah. 
All right, good. That's sneaky. That, that sells like tickets, it. doesn't it? Do you yeah, put yeah, Thanos no. I mean, a flashback trailer? sequence. When you said put Thanos back in, I thought you meant. Oh, that's no, no, what no, no, I thought. Yeah, yeah that's no, no. When you say flashback sequence with him destroying Xantar, yeah, that's something we all want to see. So, like, yeah. Yeah, that'd awesome. be awesome. Yeah. And then Dark Ops. But then I'm curious if that is the case, <laughs> why the hell wasn't Nova actually in Endgame fighting against Thanos? Well, then we'll, well get whole I mean, writer's that's, commentary. I think that's the they'll break, sit, though. They'll, they'll Mysterio Ryder, like, him got, in. I mean, he, whatever his story was, like, it ends on Xandar when he fails. Like, and Thanos beats the living crap out of him. And by the time he gets back to Earth in the blip, all over. yeah, it's all over anyway. And it's just like... Well, right, but no, but then in Endgame, by then he should be a fully formed, like, as Nova. Five no, years later. Uh, if he was Nova during, like, before at some time, like, almost like Carol Danvers, and then his story comes to an end in Infinity War when Thanos destroys Xandar, and by the time he gets back to Earth, the blip happened, and that five-year span, you begin the Sam Alexander stuff, like, what happens when he went back to his kid? But no, but he wouldn't blah, 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 become blah. Nova until Xandar was destroyed. He would be a member of the Nova Corps, but he wouldn't become the superhero Nova, who has the entire power of the Force. That would just make him, like, a really outstanding Nova Centurion that was, like, Awesome cop. I don't care. As long as we get World Mine, I'm fine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's got to have that banter with him. <laughs> he's got to be going back and forth. All right. Well, we could go to that disc till the cows come home, but needless to say, we want to see that Nova movie sooner Space, before later. Space Jarvis, but better. Like, yes. right? Nobody's like, no, none of us are up here like, no, don't oh, no. rush Nova. Nova's like, awesome. Yeah, Nova's time, right? Stop. Rush Nova. Rush Nova. All right. Finally, in our new segment today, we got our first details of the PS5. Um, Brandon, you could sit this one out, I guess, because your tastes lie elsewhere with Xbox. But or maybe you want to just chime in on somebody listen. who's looking at a superior machine. So <laughs> listen, if y'all want to drink Bud Light, I'll sit over here with my with your my what uh, Coors Light, like, Stella. You're Stella. Wow, really? I don't know. Really? So <laughs> that our was gaming your great section difference. has been uh, hard at work. And they've kind of been knocking out all these details about the PS5. First, it's a launch window. They're trying to get this thing done uh, by holiday season 2020. That's next year. No surprise there. Um, it's going to be a 4K Blu-ray player as well. Nice. Which is nice. Um, it will be backward compatible, which is cool. I mean, or no, I'm sorry. Is it? It Okay, so what they said essentially was that the architecture that they are using... There's a question about it. There it, is sorry. a piece of it. They're, they're using architecture from the PS4. So in theory, yes, it would be backwards compatible. But they mm. have not come out and clearly said, yeah. here's how you're going to do it, or we're going to have to do it like we did last generation, where like you have to get emulators and stuff. Yeah. So they haven't said that, but... So we don't know the parameters, but it looks like the hardware is set up for it to happen. Yeah. Okay. Good. It's good. So many studies for this show. <laughs> uh, and then, I mean, holiday 2020, I mean, we kind of assume that's when, you know, like some of the new machines would start hitting. Um, the fact that they've confirmed it so early is kind of nice. because I'll finally have used my PS4 for the first time by holiday 2020 because wow. I'm going to play The Last of Us. That sequel, right? Yeah. You oh, played yeah, the other yeah. Last The Last of Us Part 2. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's interesting. I do want to see one of the things they said about the controllers was that they're doing some new stuff with, like, the triggers so that yeah, it there's really new, senses. We're going like, to get, a, like, a souped-up dual shock. Yeah. Like we're kind of seeing now. But it's still based on the yeah. 4, which yeah. I swear, like, here's the thing. I love my PlayStation. I've, I've always loved PlayStation. I always prefer Microsoft's controllers. I just yeah. do. They're just weightier. They feel better in your hand. There's just, just a shape. I mean, they're more ergonomic. Yeah, and the hands. sticks being on the angles instead of yeah. the flat. Like, I've always just preferred the Xbox controller. So the fact that we're getting another yeah, Richard PS4. From the booth. Richard gave a thumbs up from the booth. I mean, it is. It's a superior, To me, it's a superior controller. So I the mean, fact that, like, we're getting another PS4 controller does bum me out. Like, you had the opportunity to redesign this thing. Though, to be fair, the PS4 controller is still better than that boomerang thing that they tried to do in like the PS3 era, which they released like a redesign for the controller. A the early prototypes looked like a boomer. It looked like a battery. Oh. The old yeah. PS3 controller, and then they scrapped it, and they just went back to the PS2 DualShock yeah. <laughs> design. So yeah, it looks that better than that. That didn't get, uh. that wasn't too popular with the fans. No, right? that went no. badly. So yeah, no. so this is cool. I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited also for launch window as far as games, but they haven't <laughs> revealed any of that. No. Um, I'm yeah, in you, the, and saying, we're still we're waiting go. to see. There could be a PlayStation voice assistant that helps you do this. We're still waiting on like final confirmation about that too. Yeah, and we're still waiting on like is PSVR right out of the box on this? Is it you know what's the? Yo, Matt is up on this. Well, right? I mean, like PS Pro right has the added VR. beef to be able yeah. to handle. 
PSVR, but like people don't like the jerry rig move controllers on PSVR. They want real like Oculus Rift or yeah. Vive controllers. So we're kind of waiting to see what the full package is. And, you know, like for me, I'm, I've got a first generation PS4 and it's starting to do some weird stuff on me. So I'm like, yeah. trade it in for it's a few. Getting a little wonky. Do you getting think a little wonky. that yeah. might be determined by like, there's like obviously going to be a huge VR push with a game like Iron Man coming out, that VR. Yeah. And that is going to be like huge in the mainstream, huge sales opportunities to get VR in homes mm -hmm. just in time for it to be outdated by the PS5. Do you think maybe they make that decision based on the response to that title? Because this is their biggest push in VR, right? For on well, PlayStation. Well, so. Out of all the VR sets, while people look at the Vive, but especially the the Quest now, which is the one that's cordless, yeah, uh, that one is kind of looked at as like that's the VR machine that you can get and really gives people the sense of VR. But it's still expensive as hell, and sure, PSVR yeah. is still the one that has hit the mainstream the best. So Sony actually has, because of the way the headset is, it's more comfortable, and the games that they have, they actually have good experiences that you can get. So I don't. I think they're going to push, regardless of whether. I think they see a thing that Iron Man will sell well, and that would be a good like, hey, this does well. Here's a sequel, in coming on the PS5 mm. in two years mm. when they can refine the tech. Did you play the Iron Man VR? No, I haven't had to. Oh. I've heard good things. Uh, I haven't had a chance to really like. No, VR I mean, is really not my bag. Yeah, no, that is not my bag either. So yeah, I, I think it's. I think it's an awesome thing. That if if like I, I can't wait till VR is fully tapped into. To, yeah, like I, I I haven't played Iron Man VR. It looks cool, but it looks like mm, I did one VR experience with Spider Man at a Spider Man Homecoming event, oh, yeah. and it was so much fun. It was so cool, and I was like, wow. And this is like we're just like this is the N sixty four of VR. Yeah, in terms of like where we're. Imagine when we hit like the age where VR is like it's gonna be like Ready Player One in real life. Like I'm when I end up getting into the VR will be when <laughs> VR Black has Mirror. a full like <laughs> Witcher like experience, Last of Us oh, yeah. experience in VR. That Not is kind we of start, what will get me. We'll over. start watching movies in VR. It's gonna be yeah. wild. But uh, until I mean, then, I saw that Black Mirror episode and I'm just not ready yet. <laughs> I'm, just still not I'm ready, ready for some VR. But I'm stoked for PS5. Also, right. it is PS5. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, that's it. We should just like, put that to bed. Yeah, we're not getting PS, like some <laughs> weird name. It's just PS5. PS5. I love how Sony just keeps it keeps it brand don't, tight. Don't bring it. Yeah, we don't need no Xbox, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. So how long until we get a big Xbox reveal then if, if PlayStation just outed their whole? Whenever they say the company's closing, I think. I mean, Project Scarlet is supposed to be coming, is it 2021 or? Or 2020, it's in the same ballpark. Yeah, like Nintendo's the only one that's just going to be riding the Switch's coattails till Who knows? forever long. Yeah. But Microsoft will have, you know, supposedly that one's a more powerful system. I mean, that's kind of Xbox's bag, right? They're they're the more they have the bigger graphical cards in there, and then they're able to do more. But like, it's kind of one of those things like finesse versus raw yeah. power. That's always kind of been the right, thing between right, PS right. PlayStation and, and Xbox. So we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Moving right along. Stay tuned because when we come back, we're getting into our deep dive. And today we're going to deep dive into our full recap of New York Comic Con. And we will review DC's Joker. So do not miss that. All right. Let's keep this short and sweet for this part, because I really want to talk about Joker, but Hootie. when last we left off, Matt was running out the door of New York Comic Con uh, to go see Servant, M. Night Shyamalan's new show coming to uh, Apple News. So how was that? Uh, I'm really so, curious. So we didn't see the pilot. Okay. We saw the trailer, which will come out in a few weeks. And the trailer gives you a really, I mean, especially if anyone's seen the teasers with the creepy baby and the yeah. weird nanny. Show like, that so do you know the premise of it now? Uh, there's a creepy baby in a weird house. Okay. So the premise is the one of the things I thought it looked excellent. Like the it's creepy. It's it's about like a two or three minute trailer. It does an amazing job of setting the scene and getting you all kind of freaked out a little bit. And some of the music is right on par. But I am going to be very intrigued to see how they stretch this out over an entire what Shyamalan says he wants to do like sixty hours. So that's if you're talking ten episode seasons, that's six seasons of a premise of when I describe this premise. I will be interested to get your thoughts. So essentially, there's a baby, and it's that creepy baby you've seen in the teasers. Uh, it opens up with like a couple, and the couple is looking on the crib, and they're like, oh, the baby, or whatever. And then the mom leaves the room, and the dad grabs the baby by the leg and hoists it up like nothing. Like just, hey, here's the thing, and starts moving across the room. So it turns out the baby's fake. The baby is a doll, not a real baby. The mother does not know that. And essentially, something happened to their child years ago and the only way she can function is to 
have this baby and treat this baby as if it were real. So the husband goes along with this because he wants to keep his wife holding on to whatever sanity she's holding on to. They hire a nanny to take care of the fake baby because the mom has to go <laughs> to work and do other stuff. And the nanny is also that kind of creepy girl you see in the other teaser. That's the nanny who's taking care of the child. And there's like a bunch of, you know, like Rupert, um, uh, is it Grint uh, from Harry Potter? Yeah, yeah. He right now plays the brother of the husband. And so like his role as far as like what his actual role is, is kind of, they haven't really hinted at. But essentially it's like this creepy, you don't know if... Like, the mom's the one who – something happened to the mom to make her this way. You don't know if she's just in some kind of psychosis thing. You mm. don't know what's wrong. Is the baby actually real? It kind of plays on all these things because there's, like, weird snap footage cuts, and then it'll say, like, don't – what if she wakes up? Like, is the narration. So you're like, who are they talking about? Are they talking about the mom waking up out of the stupor? Are they talking about the baby? <laughs> like, something weird? And then the nanny, the final shot is, like, someone's looking over the crib from – it's the dad. And he walks into the crib's room. And then, like, there's a hole in the ceiling where you can see the staircase. And the nanny's, like, holding on to the stores. And she's all coward. And the narration's, like, what have you welcomed into your home? And then it cuts, right? So it's, like, this weird – it looks like an awesome horror movie thriller, psychological thriller, but I have no idea how they're going to get this concept to stretch out over six seasons of 10 episodes each. Like, uh, from we talked to the showrunner, and that interview's up on comicbook.com, and, you know, they were kind of like, it's really a personal story about people dealing with grief with horror elements, and there are some supernatural elements, evidently, that come in later. Yeah, it's like Hill Haunting of Hill House. It's a weird it's a weird thing, but it looked awesome. Like, I was, I was hooked. I want to see this, but I am very intrigued how they get this to play out over a long span of time, because it seems like a very small, personal story. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, did you do My Hero Academia? No, I did not. Okay. Well, season four is coming, folks, and hey uh, this coming soon. Uh, Brayden Davis, you got to see some cool stuff. Um, or Matt, is there anything? I'm sorry, I won't steal the mic from you. Is there anything what? else from the rest of New York Comic Con you want to tell us about? Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, we got to, and there's a bunch of articles on the site already about talking about Marvel's Avengers. We got to try out uh, a lot of the demo, the full demo that you've seen. We tried all that out. We also got to play with Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel, um, hands on. So some of that stuff will be coming out later this week. Um, and we got to talk to the development team and combat designers and all that stuff. So we got a slew of stuff coming out. I mean, I left really impressed. I know that game has has had its share of, of hiccups as far as like how they presented it and rolled it out marketing. Uh, but it felt really good. I mean, I have so what qualms. Can, so just some quick things to just like. How does combat work in Marvel's Avengers? Is it like so you command each, a team or no? You were commanding one person. Okay. Um, the stuff we saw was that opening tutorial level. Now they say that it opens up immensely after that opening level. Like you're not like quick time events aren't going to be as plentiful. Like it's really going to open up and not be this kind of linear path. But from the stuff we played, you're controlling one hero at a time. Each one feels vastly different. Like Hulk feels so much different than even Thor, right? Because the yeah, other both powerhouses. But the way they control, it's combo driven. You know, it's it's mm. very much here's your That's series cool. of punches, here's your series of kicks. Thor, like it's on the uh, bumper where you actually one bumper sends Yolner towards somebody. And even what's great is the like, little reticle moves, and you can actually miss the person. But if you aim it right to come back, it'll come back around and hit them from behind, and it uh -huh. commands right back to you. That's great. And you're doing that stuff, plus bringing down. Each person has a series of, like, heroics, each ability that's really, like, Widow's Bite for Black Widow. Like, it's the iconic stuff that you know from the books, and they all have one. Uh, combat feels really tight for the most part. Uh, Iron Man was the biggest, was the hardest one to adjust to for me because his gameplay segment, like, it's all about working his numerous weapons. So if you just sit him on the ground and melee like you would other people, you're going to kind of get killed. Like, you really do need to use his weapons. He can hover in battle. You see, he can go back. Like, he's a very aerial person, even in just ground combat. So they all have those things. By far, Black Widow is the most fun to play. It's, like, just the sheer amount of stuff she can do. Like, invisibility and, like, the gunplay feels really crisp in your hands. Uh, like, her combos makes you feel like you're Scarlett Johansson in the movies. Like she's doing all the flips and she's doing all that stuff. Uh, so it's, it just feels really good. Like she can grapple. 
So that stuff feels great. Kamala Khan was fun as hell because they've they've got her polymorph powers so well. Like at one point, one of her heroics is to grow to giant size. So you're walking through the map and you're just swatting people and like she can r- grapple with her arms because they can es- essentially stretch across the battlefield. Uh, it, it's really cool. Like they've done a really good job of making each character feel- so on par personal. with Spider-Man? It's going to be different than Spider-Man. But I'm about like getting you that Marvel hero. But making you experience. feel like yeah. that person? I think so. Yes. Okay, awesome. Wow. Well. Uh, anything else? Uh, and then we got to test out... Uh, Dawn of X, fool. Well, Dawn of X, too. I was going to say Resident Evil Resistance. We'll also have play uh, impressions of that coming yeah. as well, which is essentially like Resident Evil D&D, which I loved. Uh, but then, yes, Dawn of X. Uh, there's a ton. We'll have more stories on the site. It was more like there wasn't like any big giant reveal other than like Wolverine. Now we're just going to be overview. Yeah, right now. Wolverine number one coming, you know, is the first of the second wave of Dawn of X books. So like Benjamin Percy's writing that. Who's writing X Force? So you can look forward to that. But one of the biggest things I thought uh, was that the core X Men book, which Hickman is writing going forward, is that we've seen that first cover right where it's all the Summers family, but Cyclops being a captain, the way he's doing this book is like each one is a self-contained story. And it's going to differ team to team from month to month. So, like, one mission, he's going to, Cyclops is going to pick the team best suited for that mission. And then the next mission, that team can look completely different. So, when he, someone asked him, like, who's going to appear in your X Men book, he literally says everyone, because at some point, he's going to switch out that roster so much because Cyclops is very much doing it as on who I need for this particular thing. That is cool because if you're getting that book, you're essentially getting in a way, every single piece of the X-Men, like Dawn of X lineup. Like, you're getting everybody. Also, he said the one that sticks true most, like, if you've been enjoying, like, the mythos and lore that House and Powers have been setting up, Marauders is the one you want to pay attention to. Because Marauders is the one with, like, the Hellfire Club, the Red King, which is going to be, you know, Kitty Pride, uh, And then it's also going to have Emma Frost. Like, all that team, he said, that's the stuff. It's essentially like an X-Men pirate adventure. And that one is really going to be the one that you're going to get to see what the world looks like post Moira and all this. Yeah, other it's going to be the world builder. Yeah. So. All right, that's awesome. Yeah, we're going to be talking about Dawn of X a lot. Brandon Davis, really, really quick, just break us down. What did you see at the rest of New York Comic Con that we should know about? Um, I mean, the only panel I attended was The Walking Dead because I did a lot of uh, just like press lines and interviews, which means I'm talking to people about panels that I didn't get to see. So that's always a challenge, but uh, we make it work. <laughs> um, but Walking Dead was cool. They're bringing Lauren Cohen back. She got on stage for a really fun reveal, and uh, the Walking Dead third series still doesn't have a title, even though they said a temporary title uh, idea that they had in the trailer, but they're not using it, I don't think. So that's it's a fun little thing that happened. Um, but it looks like CW's The Walking Dead, really. And that, yeah, we talked about it on the last episode. If you want to hear our impressions of that, they're not good, and we'll tell you why. <laughs> so go listen to that preview episode of uh, previous episode of New York Comic Con, where Brandon also breaks down some of the other stuff he got to see on day one. Me, I left. I had stuff to do. Uh, <laughs> I had to get back home. I had a wedding, so these guys were out there scrambling. But like, there wasn't there much to be seen. Uh, we will touch on one thing: was the new trailer for Star Trek Picard came Ooh. out during New York Comic Con, and it looks freaking yeah, awesome. Looks really if you're a fan of the Next Generation or the New Era of Discovery. Like, this is a perfect mix of both. There, Me and Jamie love it. We're talking. And uh, we'll be talking more about Picard as it gets closer. But me and Jamie love it. We're talking. And there's a scene at the end of that trailer. Basically, Captain Picard is contacted by somebody, a young girl who needs help for a new mission. But Starfleet's kind of moved on without him. He wants to get back and bring it back to those next generation days. But Starfleet's a very different place now. And they're kind of more hard-lined than the happy science discovery thing. And John Luke has to put together his own ragtag team of, like, Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah. Of, uh, or Deadpool 2 kind of uh, misfits. And they go on a mission. But it mixes nostalgia of who John Luke, Luke Picard is and what he represents in terms of, like, science exploration, you know, bringing people together and all this stuff, peace under discovery, like, all this great positive stuff. Um, and gives it a kind of edgier kind of vibe of Star Trek Discovery. And there's a scene with Will Riker at the end that literally just got me choked up with him and Picard sitting down and just shooting the stuff, you know, again. And uh, it's great. So I'm looking forward to that. All right. Now, for our final segment, we are going to move into our review of DC's Joker. This has been a long time coming. 
And uh, we've even brought a special guest who's <laughs> managed to sit in the studio more quiet than I think I've ever <sighs> seen him before. Smoke coming out of his ears. Mr. Turn Up Charlie Ridgely is here. Is that what you call him? Yeah, Turn yes, Up Charlie. Name. Yeah. Is that your nickname? Yeah. Uh, yeah, based apparently. on the Idris Elba is this series. The, is this the first time, or has this like been a no, thing? No, oh, it's, it's happened, been a thing ever it's since. Happened like, a bunch of times. You're talking like a 70 episode callback. Yeah, like, yeah. Mr. Turn Up. Mr. Turn Up Charlie. Okay, it's an Idris Elba series that uh, that was out. It's called Turn Up Charlie, and I thought that was perfect for uh, Charlie Ridgely. It's better than Choo Choo Charlos. So yeah. Oh, that's a I'll great one. I prefer Choo Choo. Oh, Charlos. that's a great one. I definitely. Yeah, like Turn Up Charlie, and uh, we. I mean, this is the first time Charlie and I have and done we, a show together. In yeah, like I mean, it's years. crazy. We made it happen for Joker. So, um, I'll start off. Brandon Davis, you were kind enough. You were like one of the first three people in the world to see Joker, and uh, you came in and did an early review for us, uh, and you kind of broke down your your thoughts for us, so we don't really need you. No, I'm just kidding. I'll probably uh, we're going to go out. through it again, because you've seen the movie multiple times now, and, and yes. have been kind of sitting with this the longest. Um, I'll just real quick say, I thought Joker was very good. Um, I think it's one of the better DC movies I've ever seen. Um, I think it's a really good character study, uh, and in the sense of just, I think it does its job of showing how a person could go from real life to becoming a criminal icon that the Joker is, but at the same time kind of playing with the entire concept of reality and perspective and how we see things uh, to kind of give it larger kind of artistic sentiment or cinematic sentiment as a kind of questionable tale of I mean, people, the fact that people are debating and researching and looking for clues of, was this even real? Was this the imagining of a very disturbed person? Um, we're going to be in spoilers if you can't tell. Oh, like, yeah. We're going full sorry. spoilers <laughs> now. Yeah, like, sorry. Whoopsie. Um, full spoilers for Joker. But, like, yeah, is this real or is this imagined all that stuff? I think that's what great cinema should do, and that's what it has done. Uh, there's, I mean, well, it's because Martin Scorsese made it. Yes, yeah, please. <laughs> Please. Oh, man. <laughs> Let's not get into that whole Martin Scorsese thing. Man. It just makes myself. me, whenever people over a certain age say that, I just say, Shh, wait, they'll be dead soon. Like, just let's keep moving. Like, we don't get hung up on that, what the old people say. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Jeez. Who cares what they say? Who cares? Their world's over. Like, you're not going to be here. Oh, wow. Who cares what they say? Wow. My grandma Ooh. gets limited time at the family dinner to like say stuff before I'm just like, look, this. say what you want to say, but just know you're just saying it. Don't expect me to try to live like this for the next, how long do I got to live still? Like, what am I, like, nearly 40, like another 40? Yeah, like, I don't care what you say. Anyway, so Martin Scorsese, <laughs> thanks for the memories, but we're going to keep it moving. Um, and that's my nice version of that speech. So back to Joker. Uh, yeah, so I think it does something cinematically. I think uh, Joaquin Phoenix, if nothing else, Joaquin Phoenix gives a gripping performance mm -hmm. that's really good and holds you there for start to finish. And, I mean, if that alone is worth the price of admission, I mean biopics that are much worse than this movie have given Oscars for, for less. So I think I'm good with Joker. I'm, there's a lot I would love to, I'm going to be writing about it and debating about it um, that I think is good in terms of how it, it references Batman lore and maybe comments on that lore a little bit. And I think that was interesting, but that was just me. Uh, Matt? Well, so I, cause I agree with you as far as, I mean, I liked it. I, if, if we're going for an overall, I liked it. I didn't love it. I also didn't hate it. So I'm I tend You're to be kind of just in that middle. I but I agree with you cuz it's it's well made. Like it's a, it's a gorgeous movie visually. It's Joaquin Phoenix as a performance. Uh it's it's always engaging. It always keeps your eyes on what he's doing and it is a character study. My main gripe with it is that while it's a character study, it doesn't really have a point of view. So it doesn't it doesn't present this character study as this is how we're going to look at X. This is our, here's my take on society, or here's, this is complete satire. It, it doesn't go one way or the other. It's just like, here's the thing that happens. And that isn't enough for me. Like, that, that's not enough for me to, to, I guess, give it a pass for seeing all this. I don't, I don't need to see this. And I still come away from this, like, at this movie. I didn't need this movie. I'm, I was okay before it. I'm, I'm going to be okay after it. Uh, seeing a, a white guy uh, commit terrible acts and, you know, I'm, I, he doesn't even tell me, the director doesn't even tell me that I'm supposed to necessarily feel empathy, but he never makes it clear that I'm not. 
And so I'm just left with this, like, what do I need this for? I can watch CNN for this. I don't, I don't need, you need to say something about it. And he never, he never does. It never becomes commentary on it. It just is a, here's this thing that happens. And I guess I just wanted more. I wanted that. I want you to say something about it. Because you're a director, you're putting your own stamp on this. And, it, and it's, the technical stuff is there. And the performance is there. But I just never come away with going, well, what was the point of it? Other than, you know, and I read a lot of Joker just because DC right now is so much Batman. So, of course, there's so much Joker. So I read a lot of Joker and I read a lot of different takes on Joker. And so this doesn't necessarily rise or go beneath some of the other stuff. So that's my main thing. Also, one of the things I, I took issue with is that uh, I saw some people reacting to the backlash it's getting. And I feel like they're getting the wrong message from the backlash. They're saying they go to that age old argument of. Uh, that you can't have, you know, stuff based on comics or stuff based on games or stuff based on those kinds of IP, like, that's bad. And they, they were looking at some of the backlashes like, oh, that's old hat. Like, it's just people not thinking a, a comic character can be edgy or can be adult or whatever. And I don't think that's the point. I think that's missing the point. The backlash is really about where we are in current society and whether I want people to make movies that push the envelope. I'm just saying if you're going to, have a point. Yeah. Well, but I mean, just to play devil's advocate, I'm, and I'm just curious, mm -hmm. I'm just posing this question to you, not because it's something I think, but necessarily, but just because I want to hear your thoughts. The movie portrays him as a guy who was asking for help in a lot of ways mm -hmm. and was abandoned. So, I mean, maybe the commentary is that. Welcome this, to the yeah. world. I think. Right. But like, I'm, I, but that no, doesn't that. give you the right no, to kill people and to do this. No, no, I'm not saying giving the right. I, maybe the I point is that if we stop gonna, abandoning do people. The same thing is that there is some commentary to be found, maybe. Maybe if we stop I throwing these people away and giving them I the help, feel like not abandoning that's them. rationalizing it rather than analyzing what is there. This movie, to me, doesn't present that case. It, it's it's like I'm well, digging he, for justification. Get deep, the, let's get Charlie. One in of here the first we, things he says in the movie is, "All I have are negative thoughts." And then the counselor comes back with, "Well, we're we're leaving. We're leaving you behind." Well, I mean, yeah, and let's get Charlie not, in here because Charlie is kind of also yeah. was really heavily. I mean, Charlie makes me look person. positive. Yeah. Charlie makes me look positive. I I, <laughs> I didn't. I'll just be. I didn't like this movie. I was not a big fan of this movie. Yeah, you were I, ver you were visually um, and verbally upset during the entire movie, and you were. I, I was next to I was laughing at parts of this movie because there were times when it just felt stupid. Like there were multiple times where I just I'd laugh because it was just it it was laughable. It wasn't good. It wasn't. I think Matt hit the nail on the head just now with, with we can put our own spin on it and our own thoughts on it, but that's not what the movie said. The movie didn't have anything to say at all. I think it started, and in the beginning, it seems like yeah, it wants to be a movie about how society treats someone with a mental with a, a mental disability and then it becomes a story about our society overall and and the class war and all this stuff it never really wraps the first thing and never really it deals with it again it kind of becomes this issue of society this issue of class and then it turns in the third act to just Todd Phillips whining the whole third act is just a filmmaker whining about what he can and can't do and i mean the joker says you know, arthur the character on in the movie says, oh, so you get to decide what's funny and what's not. And it's like right after Todd Phillips is talking all about all his comments about how he made this movie to like, because you can't make funny movies anymore. You want to turn what was cool on its head. And it was like, you just, you wrote it into the script. Like it was that on the nose. You just wrote it into the script. And it yeah. was, it was not cohesive from the beginning to the end. It, it, it tried to tell multiple different stories without ever actually finishing one of them. And then there were things like it needle dropped jock jams in the most important scene in the movie. So that was the <laughs> dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> it was like, here's this big dramatic moment in the trailers. And then the movie you get there and it's da -da 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 -da. that doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And it, it literally it, was it to emphasize the transformation of the all. character. And, and I think you're circling and you're both kind of saying there is no point in it. And I'd be careful because I feel like sometimes that's the projection people put on into a film that there is no point just because there's no point they see. Uh, so I would just say be careful with that because to me there's an entire thing and I think I love this about this movie is it Todd Phillips is is not making I know he says like he made this movie but this movie draws a lot a lot on Batman lore a ton of it like more than just oh this is the killing joke or oh this is the no there's a lot about Batman lore and an, an examination of Batman lore in this movie, including who this character is, why he has become such an icon, and why, and I think Todd Phillips, part of the joke, I think this movie, as one of the last lines says, the character says, 
you know, he's, they say, what do you think about it? He says a joke. You wouldn't get it. I think that is a lot more about summing up this movie than we initially believe. I think a lot of this movie is a joke and that a lot of the joke is, you know, the Joker is supposed to be this famous pop culture, mm -hmm. you know, fixation. And I think Todd Phillips has a problem with that and kind of examines like what that means and kind of that. And I think like the, there's a lot of elements from Batman lore. Like I said, I think Dark Knight Returns has a lot more influences on this movie than we think. And a big part of Dark Knight Returns isn't just the main story of the Batman and what's happening, but it's the media surrounding Batman. And I think what we don't, what has not been discussed a lot about this movie, and I think criminally so, and especially by the types who say, oh, it has nothing to say and it's, it's about nothing. There's an element of this movie that is absolutely 100% focused on media, celebrity, what that idea is, and what kind of comes out of it, and how twisted and flawed and, and, and disastrous that kind of cult of personality is. And for a lot of reasons. And, and it's something that resonates very importantly with today, where the cult of celebrity and personality has grown so far out of control to become a possible world-ending influence that this movie kind of examines it the same way. This is a character who's obsessed with a media celebrity who gets his, whose big dream, like Requiem for a Dream, is to get out and, and get on this stage where everything, you know, if he just becomes a celebrity, a famous comic, somebody who's adored by the masses in that dream sequence we see in the beginning of him on Murray's show, celebrity equals kind of betterment, freedom, all this stuff that's part of this movie. And it plays with this idea until we, third act is all about that. And it's all about what happens when we peer beneath the veil and he gets this thing, he gets to get on Murray's show, and by that time, he's figured out this kind of, it's broken him to kind of figure out the world doesn't work like that. Like, Murray's not there to make him a star. Murray's there to knock him down further and mock him for being this destitute guy. And the whole sequence on Murray's show, I think, is getting underestimated for how well it is. In some ways, it is a little too on the nose with, like, the who can write what's funny anymore. Not a great line, but, like just examining like what media is and what it does. Because Arthur is a madman and a lunatic and that whole sequence is so uncomfortably awkward with him and Murray and when he's just trying to be a guest on the show and then he kind of flips out. But what happens? The next scene shows you not just him and it's not just glorifying him, but all the TV screens around Gotham as what has just happened now begins to spread out and affect and a change and affect the whole city. And that's kind of more, that is commentary to me. It's commentary on media, how media takes something like a violent act, like a mass shooting, and, and where other movies get praised for doing this, this one's getting slammed, but showing how that in itself can be like a virus. Um, that's what The Ring was all about. Like, mm -hmm. there's a great line of The Ring. You take one person, Brian Cox, you take one person's suffering, one person's evil or bad experience, and you spread it around like a virus. That's what media is. Mm -hmm. I also, that's what kind of Joker kind of culminates in. This guy becomes a media figure, a celebrity, because of what he done, he's done. He's elevated by the worst behavior that he's put out. When he was trying to be good and just do things, do that. And that's kind of also, again, feeds back into the joke. And like that's what I think is kind of missing from some of the commentary of this movie, is the media element. And yes, Todd Phillips feels very personally about that. We, we, that's not a secret. We've seen that, but I just think that that is a part of the movie that is being overlooked. So what does the end scene then say with him and the therapist, like him in the room? And like, I feel like, because I, I agree with you. I think that's a really good point. Like, I didn't, I didn't read so much into that as, uh, honestly, I feel like you might be giving him maybe a little more credit than I do as far as like, that's what he's trying to present. Yeah. But I'm saying, uh, I'm just... Basing my things on like the actual scene, yeah. Of, like, but what I I don't necessarily buy that that's everything he was trying to do. But I get it that they're there. Like you can see the pieces there, and that makes sense. I, I also wonder. I saw the movie before all these Todd Phillips interviews came up, and I wish Todd Phillips would just stop doing interviews at this point. Because I mean, he, he's like, not helping. He's, he's I think he's, he's helping not helping his dollars, but he's not helping. Right. But I saw this movie food. before Todd Phillips said any of these comments about woke culture and comedy and uh, and compared it to John Wick and all these things, and I mean, what I saw, and I saw, I saw it like a month ago, well, over a month ago, and I, when I walked out, I was like, man, that was dark and heavy, and it made me uncomfortable. But like, that's what it—that's what he set out to do was make you feel that way. And I also don't like—I mean, I don't think every line of a movie has to be a social commentary. 
Like this no, is fiction. This I, is entertainment. I, I, I agree. And I, agree. I think when I saw the movie and Joker said, "Who decides what's funny and what's not?" I never sat there and thought, "This is a move. This is a line of commentary on PC culture, whatever you want to call it." I sat there and thought, "This is a." guy who's wrong and they're making him look wrong for posing that question in that scenario like there's no way where you're not supposed to watch that scene and say you know what this psychopath who killed three people on a train and strangled strung up smothered his mother and then stabbed a guy in the eyes with a pair of scissors is right about comedy you're not supposed to say that i disagree wholeheartedly (laughs) you're not that movie wants you to side with him by the end of it that scene in the apartment when he when he kills the guy with the scissors that scene is played entirely for laughs. It is entirely from his perspective. You are like, like my entire theater was cheering and laughing along with what he was doing because it's a movie. Like you're not he, supposed he, to... he he just like, like he has completed his transformation. He Your theater probably like, also understood that that's something terrible and wrong, and you're not supposed to do that. You're not, and then, but then it makes fun. Then it, the whole rest of the scene is making fun of another character. But isn't, that, but isn't that? But isn't that what the essence you, of Joker is? Joker does horrific things. He, he does. Yes. That make us it, laugh. He, absolutely, he does. Yeah. But so I, I want to kind of. I don't buy move that. to a different. Doesn't I don't laugh when he scalps somebody in a comic. Like that's not. And he does. Like, like he does he brutal laughs, shit and in it a makes comic. Makes you feel uncomfortable. Oh, sorry, and like, dude, <laughs> sometimes you, there's a chuckle out of that. But it, it's I not a, this many episodes dude, without. It's not that he can't be funny. It's that. The movie clearly puts you, like, wants you to be I on his that. side Seriously. at that point going forward. From because like you want to root for him at the end when like the movie makes you want to root for him. And I'm sitting there like, there's no way to root for this guy, and everyone around me is like excited and cheering. You know, look at what they did uh, with Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler is one of my favorite movies from the last ten years or so I with Jake Gyllenhaal. The X-Men. <laughs> and and that's that's a much different, I think, much better example of watching someone's descent into madness and watching someone become this crazy criminal. Because of an obsession that they had, and because, because of so why is it issues they brought into it, because this that movie never paints him in an empathetic light. That movie never makes you feel as though actually, you know what, he's got a point. Even though society has put him down, it's like no, he's he's insane. But you're, and I do not take sides but with him at Nicole any is also any about juncture. I wasn't rooting for Joker. I'm not saying the way the movie sets it up. Like, nobody was cheering in side. our theater for Joker because I was in the theater with you. Nobody was cheering for this. Every, that entire scene. In in the apartment, you guys were sitting next to each other. We I were. think people laugh at the joke with the dwarf, with the small guy, and the lock. Well, they're, they're, and I think people, I the two guys, when, when, and I think when people there's laugh a scene where the dwarf shocked. can't reach the, when he can't reach the lock, I sat there and I went, oh. Yeah, but a lot of people were like, like, oh, like that's not. When like, he oh. jumped out and scared him, I laughed because the the premise of that is so outlandish that it's just like, wow. Yeah, and the, I think the, 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 the way the way they go on to then film him in the car, the Heath Ledger scene. The way they go to film him in the in the riot, having his moment, the movie is designed to make you. I don't side agree. With him. I do and not I agree with that, that at all. I don't know. See, I, I, don't I don't think it's designed it. to make. You I don't think it's him. designed that way. I feel like maybe some people, some people will get bring that it impression. To it, yeah, and and project onto that that this is stuff that they get behind. I don't think that the movie does. I think that the movie recreates what Joker is accurately. Like in the comics, Joker is a guy who goes from just cracking jokes to suddenly doing something really horrific. Yeah. That's how he kills most people in a Batman comic. Most people don't even know they're going to die. But I'm by never Joker's laughing hand. at a Joker comic. No, like, but you're a, just like not laughing at it like, haha, that was funny. Yeah, you're like, I'm whoa, that was messed up. Like, yes, but and that's what the scissors yeah, the same in the apartment thing when he scene. Jumps at, when he jumps at the guy when he's walking past them. Like it's yeah, like, scissors, oh my god, I can't believe he did that, and you're laughing like almost in disbelief laughter. In the scissors thing, you're like, holy crap! Like what just happened? He just stabbed that guy with some scissors. It's yeah. shocking, in the yeah, way that it, it, is, it is shocking. And I think that's the only yeah. thing that Todd Phillips wanted to do with this movie is be shocking. That's the only thing he. Set I think, off to do. and again, I think well, you, you keep saying like we're projecting our own things, he but I feel like you're projecting your own opinions about Todd Phillips onto. So why am I projecting? But you're analyzing. What I know, but I. I believe well, I'm I want to know like, what would I'm happen if you. I have not mentioned Todd Phillips. I want to know what would happen if scenes. Charlie saw the movie when I did before any of this Todd Phillips stuff happened. Before I mean, he was dropping I, these interviews. That, that, and, that third act line, I think, hit because of the interview. But I think that the movie still plays. No, the same I. Way. But I. I truly before even Kofi or you brought this up, I think that you went into the movie with a negative connotation based on everything you had read about Todd Phillips and what, what people were saying. You didn't go into it fresh. You didn't get the experience of and, and you I, I think that you sometimes will let that influence your opinion. I don't know. I, I mean I mean for one, I mean he's he is the filmmaker and 
it I think it makes it easier for people to see what he's at. It's not like he said it's not like he went in and was convicted of a crime right before the movie happened and I was like, "Oh man, he's a terrible guy." It's not like that's influencing anything. It's that's that true. the it's words he about is talking about he made, why he yes. made the movie. I, he made I, the movie because he hates superhero movies and thinks they're dumb and wants to say F you to a superhero movie. He made the movie because he feels like he can't make funny movies anymore, so he wants to screw the establishment. And that's all that he set out to do. I feel with like movie. you can't necessarily disassociate that. If you're talking about someone I mean, who's he's talking about. I mean, it's he's the same right. as if you were not... to see, read, listen to the DVD commentary. Like it's it's his commentary yeah, on If movies movie. always only had the meanings of what their makers intended. Mm -hmm. Like it wouldn't be the art form that it is. Same with books. I'm just saying I don't look at this as an art form because I don't think he had any art intention behind it. He just like he, I just wanted to do it. Yeah, just but wanted to make a movie about like the Joker. The book, cool. And just and just did it with no with no intention, with no drive, with no. I mean, half of like the good stuff in this movie is directly taken from other things. It's a total ripoff of. I mean, that whole thing you were talking about with you know what he was trying to say about the media and how dangerous media can be and. So, Every single beat of that was ripped directly from the King of Comedy. I, there was not one thing that you mentioned in that that Scorsese didn't say, what, 35 years ago? It, it, was, it was a direct ripoff of that storyline. Yeah, but it doesn't... Wait, 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 wait. Like, you're just saying, what, we can't use that message again now, today? No, I, I'm not saying you can't use it. At least where try to make it your own. Like, again, where the cult of celebrity, you could argue I, in no, many ways how this, but try how to, this movie Try echoes. to make it your own. Our current, like, actual real society, like, what's that, happening. Again, the, the, the point is, is not, oh, you can't make those, you can't tell that story, but make it your own. Tell your he own did. story. No, he didn't. It was, it is, it is almost beat mm -hmm. for beat. At the end with the TVs, when you're talking about, you see the widespread thing, that is the same exact well, what's the thing difference you between get in that, the like, But in another movie, you'd be see... calling it an Easter egg. Can I, can I make If it was I've a different... It's not, it's not, here's a moment. It's not, <laughs> no. here's the thing. It's not, I've never seen it. I'm not sure It's an entire act of a storyline. I've never seen it. So it's an entire. Did you thing. see King of Comedy, of Comedy long Comedy, before Joker, or did you see it like I've watched it this year? Okay, if you, exactly. If you, if you so watch it without, so without this new piece of art informing you to go back and check out this old piece of art, you wouldn't be talking about King of Comedy. I sat through film I? class for King of Comedy, and I know who knows about King of Comedy and who doesn't. So, now uh, so I watched like, it at a different time. I'm not as old. No, as you, you so I don't only get the movie. That's what you're you only went back and referenced it because a new piece of art. Brought it up again, and I now mean, you're back in, slamming back in that January, for Back in January, when they were talking about it, in January, when they were talking about, oh, it's going to be influenced by us. Like, okay, cool. I want to understand exactly. How so this, the how homages of a new piece of art give life to an old piece of art. That's just called art. No, paying homage and copying something are they're not the same thing. Quentin Tarantino pays homage to, to classic filmmakers and to other styles. The Coen Brothers pay homage to other filmmakers. Todd Phillips just copied a storyline from Martin Scorsese. The, the third act, like, at the end when you he see He remade the King of Comedy see, as a Joker book. movie. Yeah, he remade King of Comedy as a Joker movie. Okay, because who are the people who are that experienced in King of Comedy? Not that big Venn diagram between, you know, people who love superhero movies and people who are so intimate with King of Comedy. So he mashed the two together, Be fair, I and now you're a superhero movie <laughs> fan who's coming in here with like this big chip about your expertise in King of Comedy again. So he, I'm not trying to be an expert in anything. I know, I'm, but I'm you're just, just not acknowledging. Relating. You're you're calling it copy when he used the blueprint of a film to to make a genre mashup with that film, and you're saying it's not a new thing. And even though it led you back to this old thing, you're saying like it's just a copy and therefore not bad. My whole point is cinema is constantly built on the bones of earlier cinema, like and things that have direct references or copies or even in an era of direct remakes that kind of honor these things and, and make people go back and check them out and discover them is not a bad thing to me. That's I, all see, I see both points you're making, but this also kind of upsets me because I was hoping the point would be trying to find the message here because I think the message, whether you want to talk about gun violence or mental health, I think both of those things were things that this movie could have gotten people talking about, but here we are arguing about I mean, no, old I, movies. I, I agree. I, 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 think, I, think I think all of that, and I think in good cinema, I don't think it has to be one or the other. I think the fact oh, that we are right, talking right, right, right. No, I is, agree. is the challenge of cinema. I agree. I, Bad right. cinema is cinema that comes, is crack cinema. It comes, well, remember, this is about a comic book, so it's not it. cinema at all. What's up? It's about comic books, so it's not cinema at all. I, I don't know. No, I'm not DC, going that no, Only, only Marvel. Marvel. But <laughs> only I'm just saying, like, good cinema should get us talking, and this one has. Like, we are talking about sure. all Very of this true. stuff. Uh, absolutely. There's We're a talking lot about of, comic books. Stuff to talk about. We're talking about old cinema. We're talking about what is or is not cinema. We are talking about gun violence. We are talking about mental health. This movie has sparked all that discussion.
Mm-hmm. And in some ways, you know, forget the director. Like, the, the thing is going to stand on its own and has to long after people forget who Todd Phillips is. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah, I mean, and it's, I think it accomplishes that goal. So even if you don't like it, I think it's kind of hard to slam it as not anything artistic or not anything cinematic. I think it's taken just stupid. I think it's just is a little derivative or just I, mean, uh, I, I, I think like it was, it was derivative, someone who but, uh, has watched art and watched the thing it's and kind of dismissive say, I no i'm talking about I, I, but i do also think that a lot of people are mash, mash, meshing, meshing the two between what todd phillips is saying in interviews whether it's about the movie or not what he's saying in interviews they're, they're letting that influence their opinion so like do you like kevin spacey horrible person baby driver still a good movie yeah great movie kevin spacey's in it yeah, but Kevin Spacey wasn't talking directly about. Yeah, the and, and Kevin Spacey didn't write the like story and put it together and like say this is what I want to say. He was an actor that was hired to do a job. Baby Seven, still a great movie. I'm just saying, like that's Kevin Spacey. But I think talking that's why. about why he should be able to punish, but and, but like but and on, and the, like, on the same token, other people. And talk, on the same I'm token. saying like they're two separate things to me. Yeah, one he's commenting directly about if he were to come out and say. Seven, my part in seven was this, this, and this, and here's what I was feeling. Then absolutely, I feel like you could take that run. So but what would have, what not, would have made you happy if, just if, a creepy if people dude. were talking about the controversy <laughs> of this movie and, and like the the violence of it and like how it, it relates to the real world and everything? So when the when the guy from IGN walks into Todd Phillips and he hits him with that question, and Todd Phillips is not expecting that question from a geek digital media outlet. And Why? He, because which, they, which, 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 Warner Brothers which question picks, are you, which I'll question tell you something. When about? Warner Brothers picks which who you interviews about? Todd Phillips that day, they pick specifically because they think we're going to talk about. We're in the same pot as them. Yeah. They think we're going to talk about comics and superheroes and Batman and Joaquin Phoenix and Heath which, Ledger. Which, which, which I'm talking, talking about, about when they asked, "What do you think of the controversy?" And he gave the the like the John Wick comparison. That oh, part. Yeah. What what would have made you happy in response to that? And I'm I'm just curious. Like I, I, I don't mean, so, think so, his so, answer was great, yeah. but I'm just curious. No, I, like. It, to me, the, the John Wick thing, especially it, having because at that point I hadn't seen the movie, so I'm not, I can't I can't talk to what you know what I what I thought from the movie and then heard those comments because you'd already seen the movie at that point when when, when that interview came. sure yeah, um, but I think that comparing just the tone of the Joker and what the movie was about, whether I think it achieved it or not, comparing it to what John Wick was showed a massive lack of understanding on Todd Phillips' part. So okay, so what would you have liked to hear him say? In that I, I mean, just anything, just to say, hey, because I, I agree, I don't think I made John Wick comparison and I, and I was good either, it, and that's it. Like, this movie yes, my movie is violent. Man. I'm not glorifying it. Obviously, it's just a violent movie because it's a violent guy. Like, he didn't have to have some grand answer. He just had to say, hey, I, I made it. Like, I made a movie. That and and, and let us see for itself. But that like, like been enough. When, 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 he, when he takes, it, I mean, maybe for some people, I'm, you ask for me personally, and I'm saying you have this guy who then drug another piece of of art that we all really love into the dirt because he's like oh well but you like that so what's the problem and it's like well one the character's a hero and he's he's killing bad people for reasons that's just that's just the start you know that you can't comp- these aren't two things that are comparable they're two very very different stories and i think if you made the movie and you're asking me my opinion i didn't write this movie i didn't come up with this idea i didn't make this movie if you, if, if you're asking me if i wrote a movie and you're asking me about my opinion of my movie i could give you a thousand answers about why I told the story and why it's this way and why it's that way. I could answer everything you well, gave me I because think I think you're created. also skirting the question of what the question he was trying to answer was, like, where is the line in violence in, in popular mass media? Like, John Wick, for whatever reasons he kills, is still an exhibition of violence mm-hmm. in mass media that we love. I agree. Joker isn't an exhibition of violence. It's a movie that has really shocking, violent parts. So, like, what's the difference there? Because you you watch in the movie, you watch this guy. One's more and affecting and, and disturbing than the other. It seems to be the only answer. No, because he's this he, he never is painted. Like, this one makes he's me not to be fair in Joker, and I'm not. I I feel the need to like preface everything with like I don't think Arthur Fleck's a good guy. All the people he kills in the movie are people who were trying to hurt him or negatively impact him. Like I don't think he left. The, I think when Zazie Beat said, "Can I get someone to help you? Can I call someone?" He left the room and he didn't kill her. There was no indication that he killed her. His mother hurt him and lied to him. Uh, the guy who gave him the gun and then tried to cover it up to keep his own job cost him his job. Then then he got he got, killed him. Those three guys in the subway were beating him up and picking on a woman. And then our, our Murray Franklin invited him on a show to humiliate him. So none of those people were particularly well, good. So what people. about his therapist? 
The therapist at the end, I don't know, did we kill, I, I don't know, did he kill her at the and end? And that's still, is, is it real or not? It bothers me, because it's like, okay, we explore, okay, we that's, explore a, that's a nothing. different issue, but going yeah. back to you're arguing about John Wick, saying like John Wick is a good guy killing bad people for a reason. I mean, that, Every that, person Arthur killed, he had a reason. Yeah, and again. To, to some extent. Point. And I mean, again, yeah, and it just goes back. He didn't kill Todd, any, he, he let the guy out who was always that's nice. That's a separate discussion. He Todd unlocked Phillips the door. was talking about ma- like violence and, ma- and popular media. Like, if one movie can show, like, all kinds of extreme violence in popular media, how is it taboo for another film? Well, and I also think, like, with John and Wick, we're not answering here's, that question. We're, we're established here is this, and like... instead, outrage culture has been, oh, well, it's apples to well, Don't ask me a question and then answer violence. it yourself. I, I, I'm not asking a question. <laughs> yeah. I don't I'm think it's saying this is violence, what the though. question was asking. Yeah. I don't have an answer for that except to say everything is subjective in film. One film's exhibition of violence could be hilarious. Zombieland's hilarious yeah. if they're blowing off people's heads and stuff. Joker, not so much. But all, all I, the I entire John Wick franchise. Because I get you, because you can't, like, violence is violence, whatever, right? Yeah. It, it's across. The whole John Wick it, franchise puts you in a, it, this, this league of assassins. You are, you are watching and witnessing I don't this need league explanation of assassins. the John Wick franchise. I know, like, what happens. Okay, I'm, I'm setting point? it up. Let, let me finish. Okay. I'm setting up, here's what this is. Joker is like, hey, here's this guy just like you and me. He's just like us. He's normal. Society that doesn't like him. Never he says, has problems. When does that movie say? At, that from movie the very ever, first frame. I, mean, just, just, I don't just, think I ever how, said he's a normal how are you, no, how, you were just throwing no, that out there. No, that is no, not no, true no. or earned. I'm not saying that we're just, I'm saying that's that not what just that like, movie I'm, says. You can't prove that. It Brian says that he's a normal boot. person. <laughs> like he says he, he's a When he's does it say that he's a normal person? When the movie starts and he's already on a small diet of antipsychotics, when he's been institutionalized, when he's already questions and then answer them. You're not, you are, I'm not answering a question you are using opinion instead no, of I'm real not, film how analysis am I using opinion? and this is the problem today there's too much of this crap you're not you are not quoting you're saying the movie says this thing to us prove it tell okay. me scenes can where you the movie listen says to me for that. two seconds yeah. Say something worth listening to. I'm yes. saying the word normal as in every day, as in people you see on the street, as in someone who doesn't have the abilities of an international assassin, someone who doesn't have all the money in the world and the gold coin system and 30 guns in their basement. It's just a, a somebody that lives in a cheap apartment, a person. He has, he has issues. The reason he, I disagree seriously with you, psychotic I'm person. The, the with, reason with I disagree laugh, with you, with a laughing kind yeah. of nervous neurological. I'm just saying. But the reason part, like, I disagree with you is because what you're saying is that these are all things that are associated with like a positive thing to have, yeah. like a super, <laughs> uh, a skill, a skill like a super assassin or a million dollars like Tony Stark or Bruce Wayne or something. But we also don't have. I mean, and some people do. But we, I, I don't, and I don't think you do the the negative aspects that right. he has. So he I, I already think, is I think a different when character I was, from when I was ourselves. Using the word anyway, normal. I think sure. I, I, that was being misconstrued a little bit. He's like I just a, meant a a person that you know that that lives that lives next door. Right. Very regular. Before we wrap up, I yeah. just want to say I don't think We're anybody who has an opinion is wrong. I, I, if an opinion can't be wrong, you guys are all. I, I don't live all. in that age. Opinions are complete BS. You could no, you could have Facts your opinion. And analysis. You have your opinion. Yeah, you can. It doesn't. But just don't. I'm fine. Yeah, with you're opinions. right. You know what? My uh, saying is, you can have your but opinion. Don't, but don't to, think your opinion matters. That's so why does your opinion saying. matter? I didn't say my opinion matters. I haven't talked up my opinion. I haven't said anything about right, my so opinion. We're all gonna go to <laughs> Old Stone yeah. Creamery after this, guys. I haven't said anything gonna, about my opinion. Can't. We're all gonna. I've just a questioned a, a lot of opinions that are being thrown around right. as okay. fact and analysis. That's what. All I'm right, doing. that'll do it for this episode of Joker. Uh, like the movie, the movie has uh, broken us just like it broke Gotham, <laughs> and now we are ready to riot. Uh, oh, half of us will be in man. clown masks by tomorrow, Oof. I'm sure. I'm sure you guys have thoughts. If you want to continue the discussion of anything we've been discussing today, please go to the hashtag Comic Book Nation. If you are just getting into the show and jumping on some of these uh, event episodes for Joker or New York Comic Con, you can find new episodes every Wednesday and Friday on comicbook.com, or you can subscribe on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Google Playlist, or tell any Amazon Alexa device to fire up Comic Book Nation podcast, and it'll start the show for you. If you want to talk to us individually, you can find me at Kofi Outlaw. You can find me at Matt Aguilar. CB. And you can find me at Brandon Davis BD. Charlie. Oh, and I'm at Charlie Ridgely. All right. So that'll do it for this episode. Be sure to tune in with us next time where things will be uh, hopefully a little bit more chill and civil. But uh, now you're talking who wants about to Joker. listen to chill and civil? <laughs> Nobody I know. Wants who to wants listen. to hear that, right? Let's talk well, about how to turn your dragon or something. So <laughs> we made it to the end of this. Thank you for hanging in there. This has been Comic Book Nation, and uh, we're out. Deuces. <laughs>